Thanks for checking out this movie review video. So this is for the 1993 film Jurassic Park. Yes, that massive blockbuster that I'm sure people have seen so many times. People talk about it so much. It's very well known. It's wormed its way into pop culture and has been there for a long time because it was unbelievably successful. Now, because so many people know this film so well and even people who haven't necessarily seen it know about it because it's so highly thought of and talked about, uh, I'm not going to do kind of a normal-ish review. I mean, to a degree, I will. But I'll talk about some things that I think are particularly interesting about the film, things that I think are important. Definitely get into the themes and the subtext of it, because that's mainly what I want to get out of all my reviews. And just talk about some things I thought were interesting that I found in my research that I didn't know about the film. Obviously, there's plenty of stuff that pretty much everyone knows, but hopefully you get something extra out of the film here. So... Getting into it. Oh, and when I watched this, it was on Netflix streaming service, so you can check it out if it's still there. Directed by Steven Spielberg. I don't need to go over what Steven Spielberg has done. Everybody knows Steven Spielberg. But what I do want to say is Jurassic Park came out after he finished doing the film Hook and the same year as he put out Schindler's List. So, yeah, obviously Steven Spielberg, unbelievably, unbelievably prolific as a director, uh, also has done writing at, at the same time. And this film, I mean, you just see the directing. You see the amazing directing. Obviously, the cinematography is amazing. I'll talk a little bit more about some of the other technical things with the film. But this is one of those films that you look at and all the technical stuff just comes together in one of the most beautiful ways. And that's why this is one of the biggest blockbuster films ever. Because especially if you watch it now and you think this came back, this came out back in 1993, like it looks good now. Imagine if you saw it in 1993 in the theater. Mind-blowing the way it looks, really. So anyway, uh, this was written by Michael Crichton, one of my favorite authors from a, being a kid. Uh, my parents were very controlling about what I could and couldn't watch when I was young, so I wasn't able to watch horror films, but they really wanted to encourage me to read no matter what it was, so I read a bunch of Michael Crichton books, including Jurassic Park and the follow-up book Lost World, uh, and when I was looking into it, I was actually surprised to find out, I, uh, I mean, I knew that a lot of films had come out being based off Michael Crichton books, but I didn't know that Michael Crichton was involved in writing screenplays for any of those films, or other films for that matter, but I found that out. So Crichton actually was involved in the screenplay for Jurassic Park. He was paid $1.5 million to option the book for the film, but then he was given an extra $500,000 to actually pen the screenplay for the film. Now, that said, uh, the, f the screenplay was then given a second pass and changed somewhat by a David Cope, or Cop. Uh, so, backpedaling a little bit. Michael Crichton, some other films that he's written scripts for, which I thought was interesting. The 1973 film Westworld, which, you know, now there's the Westworld TV show on HBO. The Great Train Robbery and Twister. Those were just a few that I thought were quite interesting. Uh, David Kopp has done a lot of good uh, screenplay stuff. Toy Soldiers, Death Becomes Her, Carlito's Way, The Original Mission Impossible, Stir of Echoes, Panic Room, Spider-Man, and the new film, You Should Have Left, with Kevin Bacon. So I haven't seen that film yet. I do want to see it. The trailer looks interesting. So this guy's still really working, still probably making a lot of money. Just saying. So this film was crazy profitable. It was six th $63 million budget, and it made $1.033 billion. It made over a billion dollars. That is unbelievable. This is a crazy cash cow. Now, that makes you understand why there were sequels to the film, and then also why it's been resurrected again with the two newer films that were done, which I saw the, the first of them, and I was like, hmm... Whatever. Uh, before the novel was actually published, there were four studios with directors attached who were in a bidding war for the film. Yes, before the book was published, that was one of the crazy things I found out. Now, some of the other potential directors, if they had won in the bidding war, were going to potentially be Richard Donner, Tim Burton, and Joe Dante. Joe Dante. Gremlins. Um, 
just think about those directors, think about Jurassic Park, and think about how different the film could have been with any one of those directors. Because it's a whole vision. You know what? Yes, I'm sure they probably still would have had, you know, they still had the same source material. They probably still would have used Michael Crichton for screenplay, but the directing would have been different. A lot of things would have been different. So it's fun to know these things and then kind of have that mental exercise of what could it have been like? Like, I would love to see now, like, a Joe Dante version of Jurassic Park. Because I feel like it would probably be more on the horror side of things, and I would really like that. Because they do pull back a lot with this film. So Stan Winston's company did the animatronics, which were amazing at the time. I mean, really kind of the star of the film. They did CGI with it, which actually held up pretty well. But the best parts, what looks the best, are when you're, they're using those giant animatronics because they're able to put the actors right next to them and it looks real. Unlike CGI, looks a little bit wonky a lot of the times, especially after, after it's been more than 10 years. So yeah. So Stan Winston's company uh, has done pr the practical effects also for the first Iron Man film, for Terminator 2, for Predator and Predator 2, and the Monster Squad, and Aliens. So there's a lot of good um, resume building right there. And actually, when they were constructing the animatronic dinosaurs for this, they actually had a paleontologist who was supervising it to make sure that they looked correct, and they had the correct like bone structure to look like the actual dinosaurs, which I thought was really cool. I mean, that's amazing attention to detail. It means they really wanted them to look correct. John Williams did the score for this, uh, and John Williams, his IMDb credits, you should just look at, insane. An insane amount of credits for, for music he's done for films, but just a few big ones to throw out there that people will know. Star Wars and Jaws. I mean, that's pretty much all you need to know, but there's an insane amount on there. Just take a look at it. Uh, Spielberg actually cites the film Godzilla, King of the Monsters, as his inspiration for how he did this film which I think is totally cool because Godzilla is really cool. And I just found it very interesting that a Godzilla film was an inspiration for that. And he said that it was kind of like a lot of it, like was the level of destruction and how kind of hopeless people felt when Godzilla and all the monsters were just destroying the city. So showing how careful the operation is in the beginning of this film, I think is uh, when they're moving in the dinosaurs in, and then something goes a little bit wrong is a really important moment because it shows you how many levels they're going to to kind of ensure that things are fine and safe and everything like that. And even though they do that, things go wrong. And that's heavy foreshadowing that obviously things are going to go wrong later. And that's, you know, based off the trailer before the film even came out people knew that's what was going to happen. You know, things were going to have to really go wrong on an epic scale. Now, that said, there's so much heavy foreshadowing in this film, a crazy amount. There, I cannot, I can't even count how many times there's foreshadowing, more vague and more like blunt and beating you on the head, leading up to things really going wrong in the film. And for that reason, I kind of don't like that aspect about it now because it just feel like, feels like it's this constant like winking at you and not like a quick wink like that so wink like like if someone did that to you in person doing one of those real quick or doing a it you know what i mean like it's exaggerated and you're just like okay i get it i get it so i wish that a lot of that had been kind of pulled back uh it just beats you over the head and i don't like that type of stuff but it was important for them in the beginning to show that things can go wrong. Another thing that I thought was kind of interesting is more of like a subtle things will go wrong was when Grant uh, ends up touching the television at his paleontologist site in the beginning or ar archaeological site in the beginning. And he um, it messes up. And then Sadler basically says, oh, he's not good with technology. And that kind of like that foreshadows for you that he's. He is a person who's not good with technology, and when he touches it, it goes wrong, is going into this high-technology amusement park that basically needs that technology to have things not go wrong. It just lets you know that he's kind of like the curse coming to the amusement park that will just set everything off. So I thought that was kind of a funny foreshadowing and cool. Uh, I'm with Grant on the thought about not really liking kids, and one of the things that kind of 
I think is dumb about this film is that they use the fact that these kids are in peril to uh, endear to Grant that he should have kids. Because I guess, like, through the whole harrowing experience of him, you know, having to save these children, he then feels closer to the kids and is like, oh, I could have kids of my own. But I think for me it would personally, like, be the opposite, where I'd just be like, these kids did really stupid things and got themselves into really awful situations, and they shouldn't have been here in the first place. So I definitely don't want to have kids. But that said, the, the kids are useful at times, and that's why they kind of work that in. Although I will say one of my biggest arguments is the fact that uh, Lex, the girl, is a hacker, a computer hacker. How old is she? She's like 14 or 15 or something like that. That's not even close to being believable. It's stupidity. And the other thing is that she sits down and like fixes everything system, computer systems wise in the in the park. Um and it was my it was my understanding that this park was like custom built computer technology and Dennis Nedry the one of the evil guys in the in the movie had basically even said so earlier in the film so for this like 14 15 year old girl to like sit down at a computer and be like oh i'm a hacker i know how to take care of this do 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 and we're good unbelievably ridiculous really stupid does not play well and it's a huge eye roll for me whenever I see this film. And I hate it. And that never should have been in the film. I don't even remember if it's in the book. Because since I read the book, I just remember the book was better. But I don't remember differences so much. So Hammond's disdain for lawyers in this signals kind of like a headstrong manager. Uh, man, ugh, sorry. A headstrong manner of how he basically will just forge ahead no matter what's going on. Uh, like I said, there's so many indicators that are even seen by Hammond that something can go wrong or will go wrong. And he just chooses to ignore it because he's so focused on making this a reality. He's already put in so much effort, so much money and everything that like no matter what, hell or high water, he's going to make this happen. And only the gigantic catastrophe of what happens in the film it is what, you know, in, encourages him to be like, okay, I have to give up on it because it's just not even salvageable at this point. But he's so headstrong, and it goes into what kind of Malcolm says about, you know, you did all this because you could, and you didn't stop to think, should you? And I think that's kind of one of the biggest, like, underlying themes in the film of, you know, should human beings, because they have the ability through science to do certain things like clone dinosaurs... Um, should they do that? Not do it, should we just do it because we can do it and see what happens? Uh, it's more of a, if we can do something, we should then step back from it. Consider, is this a good idea or not do a real cost, uh, cost benefit analysis and then come to a conclusion of, yes, this is actually safe or, and or good for the future and society and everything, or no, this is, this is too much of a problem. So, but Hammond is just so headstrong in this. And, and his disdain for the lawyer in particular kind of shows that because the lawyer is there to kind of put the checks and balances into place and do the cost-benefit analysis, literally. And Hammond's just like, whatever. And then obviously the lawyer gets eaten. So uh, the hokey education video, I actually think is very over the top, but at the same time, it feels pretty real for what I think an amusement park does. I've seen kind of um, videos, hokey videos like that at, kind of theme parks and stuff like that before, so it feels pretty real. Uh, early on, I, I, I question the the choice, once again, about using frog DNA to blend with the dinosaur DNA, and I say it's a, it's a really weird thing that stands out to me initially in the film, because I was like, why would you mix amphibian DNA with reptile DNA? I would think that it would be blended and filled in with like iguana or something like that, like reptile to reptile, not amphibian M to reptile. So from a scientific standpoint, it doesn't make sense to me. But then again, I'm also not, you know, a scientist. So, you know, that's just my opinion. Uh, Malcolm's quote about life not being able to be contained is very strong foreshadowing, but that's one of the good foreshadowings because it really makes you start to think because it makes you think past the film itself. It's not just about the film. It's kind of, you know, life will always find a way to move on. And that's in, in the face of, you know, just saying, well, we'll just clone these dinosaurs that are females. Therefore they won't procreate. Well, no, 
you have to know there's evolution and adaptation and everything like that so it'll move on but then it also plays with the aspect of you know life will move on with the people because the people will find a way out and even if there's a big disaster you know on a civilization scale civilization will still move forward to some point so i like that comments about the raptor intellect is yet another one of those kind of red flags um the the red flags that hammond sees very clearly but then it's just like oh you know that's fine because they they stress so much that like oh these raptors are unbelievably smart they can figure all this stuff out yet they don't think ahead to think man they could really figure this out and this could be a real problem and to that i think the best parts of the film in my opinion other than the initial reveal of the t-rex and when the t-rex gets out and is messing with the rovers um anything having to do with the raptors any scene with the raptors are like the best parts of the film, in my opinion, because they're so interesting, they're so agile and small, and it feels like they're much harder to get away from than something like a T-Rex, because you can kind of hide from the T-Rex, especially because if you just don't move, but the raptors, they're a whole different breed, and they're so lethal, and they're sinister, because the other thing is, like, you see them, and it's like they have a sneer on their face, which I like. Uh, and then the scientists just can't follow the rules. That's another thing. You know, when they're there doing their kind of run through of the amusement park, it's like they just don't follow the rules. They keep getting out of the rides and just moving ahead. So I just thought that was funny. The uh, man and nature end up coming together to create the perfect storm for everything that ends up going wrong. The perfect storm. You know, man in the sense of Dennis. Uh, being greedy and trying to steal these embryos and take them to a competitor. And then also that storm, actual nature storm coming in and really messing with things at the same time. Those things converge to make that catastrophic issue, which I thought was very interesting. Uh, it's not just one. Just one, either just nature or just human element could have made everything go wrong. But it was, I thought it was interesting that the combination of the two made it all go wrong. Obviously, the T-Rex reveal is awesome. It's really, really good. Uh, I like how Grant and Malcolm just end up watching the T-Rex try and eat the kids for quite some time before they actually get involved and feel like we should try and save these kids. And I think a lot of people don't think about that, but we, if you rewatch the film, just focus on how long it takes Malcolm and Grant to actually try and do something to save those kids. It's after the rover has already been flipped on its top, and they may very well be dead at that point. We know that they're not, but they don't at that point. I like the shot showing all the merch in the store and then going and showing Hammond kind of very sadly eating a bunch of ice cream because uh, I thought, well, I guess all that stuff's not getting sold. I saw that was kind of funny. It kind of shows the hopes and dreams and planning and then the contrast of where it actually is. So I think it's a cool shot for that reason. The first Raptor appearance is one of the best scenes you know when uh saddler gets the power turned back on and then the it, it's a good jump scare the the raptor head comes like flying through some of the electrical cords and she's like oh my gosh that's a great moment it's the best jump scare in my opinion and it's um yeah it's cool and that's when it marks like here are the raptors that's the first time you see the raptors and then you get all the raptor awesome awesomeness um at the end, Grant is looking at the flying pelicans when they're leaving in the helicopter. And it, you can see him just thinking, basically, I like them better as birds. Because there's a lot of emphasis on him saying that he believes dinosaurs, they didn't just, like, become extinct, that they kind of, you know, evolved into basically birds. And so it's a cool kind of bringing it all together in the end where, you know, they're flying away from, from the island and there are these pelicans flying and he's looking and just being like, yeah, I definitely prefer this version of where the dinosaurs have gone versus the old version that's very dangerous to try to kill me. So I thought that was cool. So this is ultimately about man thinking they can con control nature. Now, this isn't an old concept. This is something that gets played with a lot in horror films and just in film in general. And it is a problem in society where we think we can always control nature. And that's how we end up getting into all these terrible situations where, you know, we build 
housing in floodplains and then there's a flood and then we're like oh my god it's a catastrophe but we knew that would happen but we felt that somehow we could overcome nature you know things like that or the fact that we never really think about you know tornadoes being that big of an issue or hurricanes or anything like that until they're happening and then we can't do anything about it really you know there's a lot of planning and things that can be done ahead of time to try and mitigate some loss loss of life and physical things but ultimately we're at nature's mercy when these big things happen and this film kind of is one of those things that shows that you know you want to bring back some really old species that nature got rid of it wasn't in nature's plan so guess what things are going to go wrong and nature's going to overcome humanity because you thought you could control it but you cannot control it so i like that about it it's also about the morality and danger of bringing the old species back and making the statement that nature should be left to take care of itself. And this kind of gets back to the whole, you know, should we do it or anything like that. Um, so, yeah. This came out during a time when a lot of discussion was starting about human uh, impact on the earth. So this kind of plays into a lot of those anxieties right now. Um, or back then it plays to the, some of those same anxieties. That's when things were really getting going about talking about like global warming and just like the terrible impact that humans can have on the earth. And the interesting thing to me is that a lot of people, uh, kind of frame talking about that in a weird way. They talk about it as, well, let's protect the earth. Let's keep the health of the earth and stuff like that. It's not really about that because in some way the earth will continue uh, it's just, will it continue with us? Like, will it maintain its survivability for us? And, and I think that's how I personally look at it is I want to maintain the earth in the best way that is um, comfortable for the human species so that we can stick around as long as possible instead of, you know, oh, just protect the earth because we need to just take care of the earth for the earth. No, we need to take care of the earth for, for us. Uh, literally, because otherwise, it's not it's not it, it it becomes inhabitable for humans. There's still a lot of other species that will stay, and the Earth will be there until the sun swallows it. But I don't know when that is. Uh, just saying. Uh, you can also see the great evil of money in this film. Money makes the park happen, and money makes Dennis shut down the computer systems, which leads to all the problems. And it's not just money being evil, but it's more of money driving ill-informed decisions, money driving people to look past the dangers, look past the potential issues, look past the impending issues that are coming, and just see those dollar signs, put their head down, and keep going. Money is a very strong motivator, and if you think about it, it's not even real. It's a societal concept that if everybody woke up tomorrow and said, we don't believe in money anymore, it wouldn't have any impact anymore. It would have no power and it wouldn't exist. And that's a really interesting thing. But that's just my little you know, rant about the concept of money and everything. Obviously, I abide by it because you can't really get out of it at this point, but whatever. Anyway, that's a whole other thing. But hopefully you enjoyed this review on Jurassic Park. Definitely interested in hearing what people have to say about it. Uh, put it down in the comments and uh, do me a quick favor though hit that subscribe button because I really appreciate it uh, whenever anyone subscribes to the channel uh, and if you are going to hit that button or you already have hit the notification bell as well that way you know anytime I'm putting up any reviews or putting or doing live streams or whatever but real quick I, I almost forgot I got to do the star rating for this so out of five stars with half stars in play in hindsight this is a four star film I was between four and four and a half, but some of the plot holes in it and the crazy uh, bashing over the head for shadowing, um, I'm going to take it down to a four star. But no, I was kind of between four and four and a half. It is fun, and I had a good time revisiting it. But anyway, thanks for checking this out, and until next time, keep it brutal.